logic mathematics mathematics and mm, theory in antiquity and the second part is the scientific revolution of the 17th century Well, uh, I have already delivered the same, um, how to say, lecture or seminar in uh, Russian. So today um, I have to somehow translate it into English mentally. Uh, so, well, I hope I will succeed, but if, if I will just, uh, um, well, uh, you understand that if I will be not so swift in uh, English, in finding correct English words, you can also help me. Or maybe the, um, uh, the internet can help me. The scientific revolution, revolution of the 17th century. So this, uh, there's two parts here we have. So we'll divide. Um, well, I'm not. I'm not sure if we'll have uh, continuous zoom or it will be interrupted after 40 minutes. Anshita, we we have. It is a uh, continuous zoom, Franz. Ah, continuous. Yes. Know. Yes. So this will be. Uh, so this division will be only abstract or mental division. So you know, we have to sort of divide today's lecture into two parts. So we'll first we'll speak about antiquity and then we'll uh, proceed to speak about the revolution of the 17th century. So what do we have in antiquity? In antiquity we have uh, so-called um, uh, schools. Uh, we can see schools, uh, schools, and uh, the first school is uh, um, the uh, atomistic school, atomistic, uh, atomistic school. Uh, the the representative of this school is the, the most important representatives of this school are Democritus. Democritus and Epicurus. Well, if you don't know these names, uh, please uh, memorize them because we'll need them during the whole course. Epicurus. So uh, I will just dwell a little bit on atomism uh, because it will help you um, to understand what is theory. We, can, we cannot say that uh, the ancients had concise or full or uh, um, uh, um, how to say, uh, uncontradictory, non-contradictory, non-contradictory atomic theory. I think they, uh, their atom, their, um, they invented, uh, of course, the term atom, or in Greek it was atomos, which is which means uh, indivisible. But their theory lacked consistency. That is why it was criticized by Aristotle. So it lacked lacked inner logic, sort of. But of but it has its. Uh, uh, pluses and uh, its um, good points. And uh, that's why the term that they coined atom uh, survived. And so we have now atomic physics and uh, atomic energy and so on. So this um, and the, this survival, this uh, lasting existence of the word that was invented by Democritus in the fifth century before 
uh, Christian era shows that this uh, atomic theory was very fruitful in spite of it, uh, deficiencies, in spite of it um, a lacking of, uh, of non-contradictory character, in spite of its contradictions uh, and inconsistencies. Well, uh, so um, that's why we, we say that uh, the ancients had this atomic atomistic school or uh, atomistic theory of everything so that all the world was is composed out of tiny at atoms which move in infinite void uh, so um, uh, we can speak about a theory what is a theory theory is a uh, the explanation of the universe of everything so if we if we have a, a theory then we can explain everything so atomist um, atomists uh, did have a theory well every theory starts from some definitions and axioms and uh, atomists started with this that uh, in in the world nothing exists uh, except atoms and void so there are two principles of existence atoms and void and all the uh how to say all the richness of our sensual experience uh we may i mean um colors so sounds or um orders um tastes they all are sort of illusions because under this all we have only atoms and void nothing else so all these sensations are called are created by atoms uh, somehow interacting with our uh, organism so this uh, well more or less the main ideas of this atomic theory of course modified and uh, ex extended and uh, um, how to say completed somehow they exist to the present day uh, and we'll speak about that later now we just need a, a um, i think that that, that what these few words that i have spoken are enough to uh, sort of illustrate what is theory in antiquity? The second school was the Pythagorean school. Pythago, Pythagorean school, um, which uh, is uh, built on quite other uh, principles, not um, according to Pythagoras what is important are not atoms and void or we can see material principles but some ideal principles which are numbers so numbers rule the world well we can say that this pythagorean view on the all importance of mathematics was uh, also uh, what also had a great future. For example, we can uh, uh, remember the famous dictum of Galileo that the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. So this is a typically Pythagorean idea that uh, under all these uh, events that we see in the world, there are certain laws and these laws obey mathematical principles and can be described in mathematical formulas. So uh, mathematics is like the foundation of um, all the world. Uh, also, we can remember the, uh, uh, the phrase of Eugene Wigner. Well, maybe if you are not acquainted with this uh, um, person as uh, he's a Nobel laureate in physics and uh, Wigner, and he studied uh, quantum mechanics. Um, 
he said that there is uh, unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in natural sciences. So why it is unreasonable? Because it has no reason. Reason means no cause. So we can find no cause uh, to explain why mathematics proved to be so um, effective in physics. And uh, well, starting from Newton, we are uh, witnesses of the validity of uh, this, um, uh, how to say, of, of, of this principle that of that effectiveness of uh, mathematics in natural sciences. So, uh, well, um, this is another school, Pythagorean school. Well, uh, what P Pythagoreans didn't do much, uh, I think, uh, I, I, I mean, in, uh, um, do in creating mathematical physics, but they uh, laid foundations of uh, logically um, cons uh, logically um, complete and uh, mm, I would say um, good mathematics. Um, first of all, um, they, 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 this was in, with the Pythagoreans, what we find there is the insistence of logical proof. So, um, for example, uh, in, in frames of the Pythagorean school, there was proven a theorem or um, how to say, assertion that uh, the diagonal of uh, the square is in commensurate, in commensurate with, its, uh, with the sides of uh, the square. So we cannot find a proportion between the diagonal and the side which can be uh, given in uh, like uh, in uh, uh, certain um, numbers. Uh, we, so we, we cannot say that uh, we, we can find a, a little um, sort of, um, well, uh, a, a little measure which we can sort of, uh, um, well, that uh, the diagonal and uh, the square and, and, the, and, the si and the side of the square have some uh, common measure, which uh, we can say um, uh, M, uh, well, with, where M and N are uh, being natural numbers, uh, we can say that this measure is M times, um, the, the, the diagonal is M times uh, uh, the, this, measure, uh, this measure and the side is N times this measure. So this cannot be because uh, um, otherwise we come to contradiction that M, uh, um, is uh, well that uh, because uh, the square of a uh, uh, the square built on the diagonal will have uh, uh, this yes uh, the square built on diagonal will, will have the square two times larger than the the initial uh, square and so we'll have uh, this, uh, um, we'll have uh, this, I don't know how to put it, um, M, M quadrat, M square of M will be equal to two squares of N. So this, uh, uh, this uh, equation doesn't have a solution in natural numbers. Uh, so this is a, well, a non-trivial assertion and the, the Pythagoreans were very, very proud of it 
and they kept it kept it secret parity yes so uh, you see that um, well you cannot find the solution of this equation in natural we, we say natural numbers but perhaps uh, the english say just no well um, I, I, I can find it um, natural numbers so Well, they, they say natural numbers also in it's or the in, same in English also. Yes, integer also. They say integer numbers. They say uh, non-positive and non-negative integer. Yes, but so so the problem. Well, I think you know about that problem because uh, um, we uh, sort of uh, we can say that the Pythagoreans sort of stuck upon uh, the irrational number the problem of irrationality. So, because uh, uh, the diagonal is uh, uh, square root of two, for example, if we have a, a side of a square. Um, but it is, not first, uh, it is not first problem the uh, people invented uh, irrational number. The first problem was invented by Hypastus. The diagonal, the diagonal of uh, pentagon, regular pentagon, we mm -hmm. compare with uh, the length of the side of the pentagon. Well, uh, it's, it's golden uh, ratio. It's like the golden ratio. Well, the, the, um, I mean that uh, because I'm speaking about Pythagoreans and I don't possess the information that they studied pentagon. Um, maybe in other cultures, in India, for example, or somewhere else, um, uh, there were invented different approaches uh, to this uh, problem of irrationality of numbers. But uh, what, what, I, what we can find uh, in the sources about the hi history of mathematics in antiquity, we can say that it was this problem of the square and the diagonal of the square, which uh, sort of um, shocked and uh, uh, how to say puzzled those uh, uh, ancient scientists. Now we have another school, which is called, we can say that it is continualistic school. This is the school of uh, or continualistic scientific program continue continualistic uh, and or Aristotelian uh, as, uh, what can say school uh, or scientific pro program even what is continualistic it is to distinct contradistinguish it from atomistic I'm sorry I will just open the window um, it is too hot in the kitchen i'm here now in the kitchen and it seems it's too hot because the central heating is already um, uh, working uh, functioning so now we have this continualistic school and it is associated with aristotle uh, Aristotle. So Aristotle um, had this uh, uh, another model for explaining everything. So there were first of all four elements uh, of the sublunar world. Um, I just I will explain it in details. Four elements. Elements of the sublunar world. World. Well, what is sublunar? I will just ponder on it later. Uh, so 
uh, four elements. These are earth, mm, water, air, and fire. And why we can call this uh, uh, school continualistic? Because uh, if we divide water, according to Aristotle, we can divide it in infinity. So we cannot, the, our division will never stop. So uh, there are, how to say, infinitesimally uh, small parts of water. Well, this is, of course, uh, incorrect from the modern point of view. When we come to the um, size of a molecule, the division will be finished and will have no, when, when we come to the size of the molecule of water, we cannot divide water further on. So it will just um, uh, be dissolved into atoms and then the atoms in elementary particles and so on. So we will have to stop this division. So Democritus was somehow right when he said that uh, there are some indivisibles, there, that the division has its limit. Uh, but at that time, there was no um, way to prove who, who was right, Democritus or uh, Aristotle. So, um, and uh, it seemed that the Aristotelian theory had its all its own um, like uh, pluses, or it it has it has its own um, well good points, strong points. First of all, its logical consistency. Uh, where we can find this logical consistency? Oh, um, Aristotle. Uh, created sort of these four elements out of two pairs of, contra of contrary qualities, uh, hot and uh, cold. Well, we, we can say hotness also, hotness and coldness. And the second pair is humidity or wetness, we can see. And dryness. So uh, now we can see that the earth is uh, cold and dry. Earth is cold and dry. Uh, the water is water is wet and cold. Oh, air is hot and wet and fire is hot and dry so you see there's no contra logically there's no contradiction uh, an element of if it will be logically inconsistent if we would say that fire is or some element is hot and cold at the same time but here we cannot find this uh, but hot hotness doesn't contradict dryness so but, uh, hotness and dryness but water can be hot also and air can be cold also Yes, well, from the point of view of, say, of dialectics of, uh, uh, say, Heraclitus, um, you, the, the contemporary of 
uh, Democritus. Uh, he said, uh, he criticized this uh, point of view. Uh, he said that um, uh, the, um, well, his dictum can be related this way. <coughs> Dry becomes moist uh, or becomes wet becomes wet, uh, uh, co uh, hot becomes cold, mm. cold, uh, no. and, uh, and vice versa. So also wet becomes dry and cold becomes hot. So all is in becoming. So we cannot say, speak about absolute coldness and absolute dryness. Well, it is more or less the present, our present point of view. When we, when we say that uh, we measure only humidity, we do not measure dryness. We say the humidity of the air is 80%. We don't say that, uh, uh, we don't use uh, the word dryness. Uh, also, we don't measure, uh, we, we don't measure either hotness or coldness, we measure temperature. And we can say that all is relative, that, uh, well, of course, uh, uh, when we say that the water is hot, it means it's uh, temperature is more than 40 degrees Celsius which is for our organism crucial because uh, of uh, uh, the temperature which exceeds 40 degrees, our um, proteins start to uh, sort of um, coagulate, okay? You understand? The proteins start to coagulate when the temperature is more than 40 degrees. So, uh, subjectively we feel uh, this uh, um, that we are burnt okay by high temperature so we have a very um, bad feeling when we uh, drink too hot water or split it on our skin okay but this is subjective uh, uh, in comparison with the temperature of hot iron for example or uh, I would say Mm, uh, melting iron, this temperature of, uh, uh, say, co co hot water is uh, mm, insignificant. So, uh, and that's why we don't, we don't speak now about hotness and coldness, we speak about temperature. Well, the same uh, see, uh, happened with other qualities. For example, uh, Aristotle used two uh, 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 words for to explain the um, velocity of motion. He used the word uh, uh, swiftness, swiftness and um, slowness. You understand? swiftness and slowness. We, um, I'm sorry, I'm writing to you all only, but I will write to everybody. Swiftness and, um, and slowness. So, swiftness and slowness. What is that? Even, even Galileo used this expression in the 17th century when he said that before the body reaches a certain velocity it will have to come through the uh, infinitesimal degrees of slowness so all all motion starts from scratch uh, you cannot uh, accelerate uh, the body immediately or even it's, if it seems that the body starts uh, uh, like uh, uh, to accelerate powerfully, still if we divide this motion 
in a very, very small uh, um, parts, we will see that at first, every velocity is uh, very, very small. And uh, this velocity uh, he calls uh, uh, slowness. But now we don't speak about slowness, we speak about velocity. But if we use the etymology, if we uh, look at the etymology of the word velocity, we will see that it comes from the Latin word velox, adjective, Latin, ah, I'm sorry, also to everybody, velox, which is uh, swift, velox. And from velox comes velocity, swift, okay? Uh, so we say about swiftness and we forget about slowness. And that's why we use the, the letter V uh, for velocity. You know, this V for velocity. Maybe in Russia or only, but I think everywhere. Uh, if you studied cinematics or kinematics at school, you will uh, also use V for velocity. Yes or no? Nah. Well, okay. Uh, yes, we no. have, uh, yes, actually, I just received the notification. This meeting is going to be over in a minute, and then I will create another link for another 40 minutes, ah, and then okay. we'll share it. I will the share room. it because I now have the opportunity to share with all people through email, because I have all your emails in one package, and so okay. I will send this new link uh, to everybody. Good? Okay, I'm just uh, uh, creating it. Yes, yes. Okay, so we'll now end this conference, which is devoted to the first question, the, uh, uh, the scientific programs of antiquity. And uh, when we'll start a new conference, we'll uh, speak about the scientific revolution of the 17th century. Okay, so I'm wishing you goodbye, waiting for the link and sending to you through email the new link, okay? Good. Okay. Yeah. Goodbye, everybody. For